Hello, I'm Jenny and I'm from Tasmania and I'd like to tell you a story. It's a story that I want to tell, it's the story of my mum and I'm telling it through her eyes. And we came to Tasmania as refugees in 1949 and we was on a ship for about six, six weeks. We travelled from um, Italy on the Nelly and when we, got to ta when we got to Melbourne, we first had to stop at Melbourne in a camp until we were allocated where we had to go. And while we were in Melbourne, um, my little sister died. Uh, she was sick on the boat and, um, and thank the Lord that she, we made it to land because I'd seen so many deaths at sea and it would have been the end of my mum, I think, if she'd have had to bury her at sea. But we made it to, to Melbourne and she died in Melbourne and she's buried in a cemetery in Melbourne. So we can go and visit her grave and um, it gives us comfort to know that that's where she is. But I'd like to tell you a story of my mum's life. Um, she was born in Ukraine and um, she was one of 11 children and at that time in the 1930, Stalin wanted to take over Ukraine because Ukraine was rich, had rich soil, had minerals, it had, it had everything. And so he, he coveted that and he wanted it. So he tried to starve and which he did, he, he, he starved more Ukrainians than what Hitler did with the Jews. He, he wanted to destroy as many people as he could and, and to get rid of them so he could take over the land. And my mum watched her family die. My grandfather and grandmother died and my grandmother died in her arms with tears. She was looking into her eyes and she had tears as big as peas running down her cheek. And, and she died in, in mum's arms. Then all her siblings, her brothers and sisters, one by one died too. And the last one was a little brother. And so they took him, they took, um, him away and put him in a, in a home and they come and told her that he'd passed away. So she had to go and find him. And when she went into this room, there were bunks along the wall and, and she was so confused because there was bodies everywhere and she didn't know who was her, where was her brother. But when he was a little boy, he, He'd had an accident and his toe was chopped off. So she went along and looked at all the feet and when she come to this one foot that was missing a toe, she knew that that was her brother. So she took her brother and, and she had to take him and bury him. So she buried him and when she come back from the burial, some of the Raleys had been to the, her home and had stripped the house clean. There was not a plate or a bowl or even a spoon left. All the clothes were gone, everything was taken. So they took her to a home too and, and she was about 15 at the time so they made her work. They took her, it was a border I think of somewhere near Peru she told me and they were mining the, a railway, they were t doing a railway track through this mountain and they were mining all the, blowing up all the rocks and they had to put them on these carriages and they rolled them up up the plank and sometimes uh, a rock would slip, the hand would slip and the rock would come down and it would hit somebody on the on the leg and they'd lose a leg and then they'd just put them to the side and shoot them because human life wasn't worth much to them so they just get someone else anyway one thing about my mum she was a woman of faith she believed in God and she prayed every morning and night that God would keep her safe that none of that the atrocities that were happening there with stones and things would would befall her so she worked there for three years and she never as much as scratched herself because God did keep his word and he kept her alive and he kept her safe. After that, she'd only just got over that and Germany went to war and they took a lot of the Ukrainians and, and many other nations, Poland and all them places, 
and they took the people to work in Germany on farms, in factories, wherever they could. They were slaves. So she worked in a, in a factory that they made masks for, for air pilots. And she worked there for, for quite some time. But in that time, she'd made friends. He was Russian and she was German. And, um, and they lived in Germany. They were, there was a beautiful family. They were, they were trapeze artists in a circus. And so they treated her like a daughter. And, and they gave her things and they looked after her. And anyway, when she was working in the factory, they would sneak her a bowl of food and they'd plant it somewhere. And then they'd just wink, you know, to say that the food was there. But someone must have seen that and got jealous. And so they reported her. And so the soldiers came and took her and they put her in concentration camp. And for the rest of the war, she was in a concentration camp in Germany and she was tortured. She was, they tried to do everything they possibly could to find out who gave her the food. And, and she, would, she would go, they'd take her into each room and they'd question her. And each time, she must have had a wonderful memory because each time she never changed her story. It was always the same story. They took her to this big hole and they said to her, they said to her if you don't tell us who, who give you this food, we will shoot you. And when she looked down into the hole, it was just full of bodies. There was arms and legs. There was, they, they, there was bodies everywhere in that hole. And she thought to herself, well, better I die. I'm, on my, I'm the only one surviving. Better I die than the whole family. Because they wouldn't have just shot him. They would have shot the mother and probably the kids as well. So she put her hand on her heart, on her heart and she said, shoot me now, I don't need two minutes to make my mind up, shoot me now because no one give me anything, you know. And so she stood her ground and the soldier looked at her and he ended up telling her to get back into camp. And so she went through camp. She, in, the, in the time that they tortured her and everything, she'd lost her hair because with all the drama and the trauma that she'd been through. And there was this beautiful old man and he must have been a, a pharmacist or something and he made up this potion and she used to put it on her head and she, her hair grew back it wasn't as beautiful as it was but it still was lovely she still had lovely hair and in in that time the lovely the the pretty women that were there were you abused and used by the soldiers and they raped her many times. And in that process of being raped, I'm the product of that. So she had me and I was born in 1945, just as the war was finishing. And they were, the war was winding up and they knew that they were losing the war. And they was decided that they would take all the prisoners that were in the camps, they would take them for showers. There was trucks, lines of trucks in the, in the queue and two trucks had gone through and we were in the third truck. Two trucks had gone through and I don't know, it, it must be God, God must have intervened or, or what, I don't know what happened but we was, we was the next truck to go in and the Americans and the Russians came in and liberated that camp and and we were saved because we we found out later that those tr two trucks had gone before us they weren't coming back they were gassed they were not shells they were they were they were gassed so god kept his hand over my mum all this time so when the when the when we were liberated we were put in um, red cross camps and we stayed there until, I don't know, it was a, in 1949 we left Germany to come to Australia. My mum had met a man and they'd fell in love and they got married in Germany. I was born in Hamburg in Germany and, and I had a little sister. She was only, um, only about uh, 12 months old at the time. 
And so we were given a choice of whether to go to Australia, Canada, America or New Zealand. So my dad chose um, Australia. So we come to Australia on the ship Nelly and it was an Italian ship. I got very sick uh, on the boat. Um, I nearly died and the care on the boat was, was absolutely disgusting. I had faeces um, in my hair, I, it, I was covered in it. They never washed me. Um, the, I can't ever remember them giving me any sort of care. And my mum used to come in and, and, and complain about um, what was going on and, and they stopped her from coming to see me and they moved me um, over to the other side and all I could look at when I looked out the window I could only see water. And anyway my mother come in and she got a blanket and she wrapped me up in a blanket and took me back to the cabin. And Anyway, the, the doctors must have come and went and seen the captain and they came and they were very nasty to my mum and they said, how dare you take her out of the hospital and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, to cut a long story short, she, she said to the captain and she unwrapped my blanket and when he seen the state I was in, he looked at the, at the, the doctor and, and, um, and it must have been a steward or a captain or, or no not a captain because it was the captain that ended up saying leave this child here with this woman and so he never he never um, said anything nasty to her again because he could see that I wasn't being looked after I had to end up learning my mum would stand on one side of me and my dad on the other side and help me to walk because I had to learn to walk all over again it was it was just like first steps and, the, and being on a boat it wasn't very pleasant. When we, when we managed to get to, um, we ended up going to, Bonagilla was the camp in, in Melbourne. When we got there we'd only been there a short time, probably less than a week and my sister um, was taken to hospital and um, she died there and it was because when she was teething they wouldn't give her even an aspro for her, blood, her for her temperature, so they, they ended up. Um, she ended up just virtually burning up, and that it was a simple thing. Um, Panadol, or the equivalent of Panadol today, uh, could have saved her life, but she ended up dying. She was only a tiny little 14-month-old baby when she died. So my mother had to deal with that. So all the things that she'd been through in her life, she never for once blamed God. She never for once um, was bitter. She, she could never forget, even when she got older, she would never forget, she always talked about her past, but she would never forget what, what happened to her. And she would, that's why it's so vivid in my mind because she discussed it with me many times because I was the eldest of six children and, um, and I was very close to my mum and she always confided in me and I didn't know until I was 16 that my, my father, the, one, the man that I called dad was actually not my biological father and, but it was too late then. I didn't care because my mum had enough love for me that would that would fill an, uh, an ocean. That's the love that she had. She had love for her children. She had love for her fellow man. She was such a generous lady. She'd give her last piece of bread or her last shirt, the shirt off her back virtually. She was a loving, kind woman. And I just hope that it's an encouragement to people. You know, there's adversities in life that we all go through. We all have a story to tell. Have courage because, you know, life could look bad now, but there's always something just around the corner. And we have had a blessed life. My mum died when she was 75. She was tired, she'd had enough. And the beautiful part about it is she'd never had an operation. She'd never had a knife to her body. She just died in her sleep. And when I went, when dad rang and I went to her, because they only lived down the street from me, when I ran, to the house and I looked at her 
She looked 15 years younger. She was so peaceful and so beautiful. And, and I thought, man, if that's the, that's the way I'd like to go, just, just go to sleep. What a, she was so blessed, this lady, to be able to have lived the life she did, to have done all that she did, and then to die just peacefully, just go to sleep. So I hope that you get encouragement from this story. Thank you.